What up, YouTube? It's not just self determination. Back with you guys with some more Black History every day. Today, we're going to be talking about, uh, rather, we're going to be going back to March 3rd, 1821. Thomas L. Jennings is the first African American to be granted a patent in the United States for his technique to dry scour clothes. Basically, Thomas L. Jennings is the inventor, he is the creator of dry cleaning. He is the father of the dry cleaning industry. So don't ever let anybody fool you. He did this and he was a free black man, which is why he was able to get the patent in the first place. Some of which I'll actually go over um, as I read to you guys um, his, his, uh, his history. Um, it's gonna be pretty brief because there isn't a whole lot of information on the man, um, but what information there is, um, is worth uh, making a video about. So I'll get right into it. Javi, a French tra uh, tailor, has long been credited with an accidental discovery that led to dry cleaning as we know it today. After spilling the contents of a paraffin lamp onto a greasy tablecloth, he watched as the stains disappeared. He went on to open the first dry cleaning shop and the craft grew from there. So the story goes, with variations, including the date of the discovery, which was reported as 1825 in some sources and as the 1840s in others. Thomas Jennings stands in history as a noteworthy figure for being the first black person to ever receive a patent, but his life should serve as an example of what was and what could have been for black people in the earliest years of the United States. And I'm going to stop right there and say that that statement is completely felonious because his life is not an example of what could have been for black people. It is not because he just so happened to be born, born free. He wasn't born a slave. He was born in New York. And don't get it twisted. There were slaves in the North, plenty of them. And slavery wasn't illegal in the North. It was just certain states that abolished it. So his life isn't an example of what could have been for black people. His life is the example of how it should have been for us with equal opportunity, being born free. That's how it should have been. And also given the choice to come to this country or not. But I'm digressing. I'll get back to it. Gen Details of Jennings' patent were lost in a fire at the U.S. Patent Office in 1836. But his life which included leadership in the movement for the abolition of slavery, as well as success as a tailor and dry cleaner, was documented by the renowned abolitionist Frederick Douglass. In a memorial written upon De Jennings' death in 1859, he first published the article in his Frederick Douglass paper. It was reprinted in the, eight, the April 1859 issue of the Anglo-African. So, not only was he a great inventor, the father of the dry cleaning industry, but he was also a civil rights activist, freedom fighter, if you would. So like I said, this man's life is worth being remembered. Of Jennings, Douglas wrote, quote, in his boyhood, Mr. Jennings served an apprenticeship with one of the most celebrated of the New York tailors. Soon after reaching manhood, he entered business on his own account and invented a method of renovating garments for which he obtained letters patent from the United States. Although it was well known that he was a black man of African descent, these letters recognized him as a citizen of the United States. This document in an antique gilded, I'm sorry, gilded frame hangs above the bed in which Mr. Jennings breathed his last breath and is signed by the historic names of John Quincy Adams and William Wirt. Wirt and bears the broad seal of the United States of America. Thomas L. Jennings was born free to a black family in New York City. As a youth, he learned a, a trade as a tailor, which included dry cleaning. He built a business and married a woman named Elizabeth, who was born in 1798 in Delaware into slavery and died March 5th, 1873. Now about his wife, Elizabeth, because his daughter was also named Elizabeth, so she was actually a junior. I'm just going to read a little bit about his wife because I just found it interesting. And I couldn't actually find any in information specifically on her or any pictures. 
but Elizabeth Jennings' mother was a prominent woman who was known for her speech on the cultivation of black women's minds. Elizabeth Jennings Sr. was a member of the Ladies Literary Society of New York, which was founded in 1834. The Literary Society was founded by New York's elite black woman to promote, or women rather, to promote self-improvement through community activities, reading and discussion. This speech was produced and given in 1837 when the younger Elizabeth was still a young child. In her speech, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Jennings Sr. speaks about how the neglect of the cultivating mind would keep the blacks inferior to the whites. This will also have the whites slash enemies believe that the blacks do not have any minds at all. Jennings believed the mind was very powerful and could help with the improvement to abolish slavery and discrimination. Therefore, she called upon black women to have a mind and take action. The importance of improving the mind was a consistent theme among elite black women. So I just wanted to add that part. I'll continue on with uh, Thomas L. Jennings now. Thomas Jennings worked in a number of jobs before focusing on what would become his chosen career as a tailor. Jennings' skills were so admired that people near and far came to him to alter or custom tailor items of clothing for them. Eventually, Jennings' reputation grew such that he was able to open his own store on Church Street, which grew into one of the largest clothing stores in New York City. Jennings, of course, found that many of his customers were dismayed when their clothing became soiled and because of the material used were unable to use conventional means to clean them. Conventional methods would often ruin the fabric, leaving the person to either continue wearing the items in their soiled condition or to simply discard them. While this would have been proven a boon to his business through increased sales, Jennings also hated to see the items which he worked so hard to create, thrown away. Thus, he set out experimenting with different solutions and cleaning agents, testing them on various fabrics until he found the right combination to effectively treat and clean them. He called this method dry scouring. And it is the process that we now refer to as dry cleaning. Under New York's gradual abolition law of 1799, she was converted to the status of an indentured servant and was not eligible for emancipation until 1827. We're talking about Jennings' wife now, Elizabeth. Children born to slave mothers before 1827 were considered to be born free, but were required to serve apprenticeships to their master or to her master until they reached their mid to late 20s. He and his wife had three children, Matilda Jennings, born 1824, died 1886, Elizabeth Jennings, born March 1827, died June 5, 1901, and James E. Jennings, born 1832, and I don't see any official record of his death. Matilda Jennings was a dressmaker and wife of James A. Thompson, a mason. Elizabeth Jennings was the wife of Charles Graham, whom she married on, 18, on June 18, 1860. James E. Jennings was a public school teacher. In 1820, Jennings applied for a patent for his dry scouring process. In light of the times, he was fortunate that he was a free man born in the United States and thus an American citizen. Under the United States Patent Laws of 1793 and later as revised in 1836, a person must sign an oath or declaration stating that they were a citizen of the United States. While there were apparently provisions through which a slave could enjoy patent protection, the ability of a slave to seek out, receive, and defend a patent was unlikely. Later in 1958, the Patent Office changed the laws, stating that since slaves were not citizens, they could not hold a patent. I'm sorry, that says later in 1958, the Patent Office changed the laws, stating that slaves were not citizens. That has to be some type of typo. It couldn't have been 1958. The law must have been changed in 1958, or it could mean 1858. But there's no way in the world they're talking about 1958. So that's that's definitely a typo. But continuing on. Furthermore, the court in the famous case Oscar Stewart versus Ned case 
said that the slave owner, not being the true inventor, could not apply for a patent either. In true irony, when many of the southern states seceded from the Union to form the Confederate States of America, CSA, Confederate States of America, President Jefferson Davis signed into law legislation permitting slaves to hold patents. For Thomas Jennings, none of this mattered because as a free man, not only was he able to receive a patent in 1821, but he was also able to utilize it for his financial gain. In fact, he made a fortune. Now, I did just want to touch on this real quick before I read, read on, which there isn't much more to read at this point. But um, now, there, there's always people out there who try to deny the things that black people have actually invented. And they'll scour the internet and try to say, oh, well, this white person did this first or this white person did that first. Now, granted, there are a lot of inventions that were that, that, that black people and people of African descent were given credit for when more than likely they innovated the technology as opposed to being the person who invented the technology, right? Their innovations more than likely led to the further evolution of a particular product or invention as opposed to some of these inventions actually being created by um, a black or African person. Um, with that being said, uh, a lot of the patents, because inventions that revolutionize and help uh, products and inventions to grow, you patent it because your designs are unique to the originals. Or unique being as though it's the only thing, it's the only version of it that exists. And um, being as though they're the, Af the, the genius of the African mind did not stop in slavery. We were still the same geniuses in the same creative minds that we were in Africa, in America. It didn't stop there as hard as they tried, which is why they didn't want Africans to have an education because we would e excel. Why else would they notice our genius and slave us, bring us over here and then keep us away from any type of in form of education whatsoever to kind of stifle our genius, which didn't work. But in any event, I'm saying all that to say this, that there were tons of things that Africans did invent that their slave owners eventually took from them and claimed the rights to and owned the patents, probably still having the African slave still working on the invention and proving it so that the, the slave master can profit off of it. Now, that may sound highly unlikely to some of you, but take into account the fact that these were people who went to Africa, put other people into bondage and servitude and subjugation, and forced them to work their land, till their land and their soil, and grow their crop for them, while they rode around on horses with whips and <laughs> I apologize for the bad language. Excuse me for that. But I'll continue on. Thomas Jennings, Jennings was a leader in the cause of abolitionism and African-American civil rights. After his daughter, Elizabeth Jennings, March 18th, I'm sorry, March 1827, June 5th, 1901, I don't know why I was giving her birthday again, was forcibly removed from a uh, whites only streetcar in New York City. He organized a movement against racial segregation in public transit in the city. The services were provided by private companies. Elizabeth Jennings won her case in 1855 along with James McCoon Smith and Reverend James W.C. Pennington. Her father created the Legal Rights Association in 1855, a pioneering minorities rights organization. Its members organized additional challenges to discrimination and segregation and gained legal representation to take cases to court. A decade after Elizabeth Jennings won her case, New York City streetcar companies stopped practicing segregation. What makes Jennings noteworthy is not just that he was an entrepreneur or that he received a patent, or even the first, I'm sorry, the fact that he became very wealthy. What is noteworthy is that he took a vast amount of the proceeds of his business and poured it into abolitionist activities throughout the Northeast. In fact, in 1831, he became the assistant secretary for the first annual convention of the people of color in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He passed his sense of self-worth to his daughter Elizabeth, who was forced off of a public streetcar in New York City, which she was riding to go to church. Because of her father's prominence and wealth, she was able to obtain the best legal representation and hired the law firm Culver, Parker, and Arthur 
to sue the bus company and was represented in court by a young attorney named Chester Arthur, who would become, who would go on to become the 21st president of the United States. Ms. Jennings would ultimately win her case in front of the Brooklyn Circuit Court in 1855. Thomas Jennings died in 1859 and will go down in history as the first black person to obtain a patent. But he should rather be seen as an example of a citizen who made the best of his life and sought to use his good fortune to make life better for those around him. I mean, that's a very good sentiment, but no, he should be remembered as a black man during during a, a time of slavery in America who was born free, who did what he did and was in knowing the climate, the racial climate of the time was still brave enough to fight for the abolitionist movement. That's how I'm going to remember him. You can remember him however you choose. But I'm going to remember him as a free black man who, in spite of the the the, uh, the climate of America during the 1800s, the 19th century, still fought for his people. So that's how I'm going to remember him. Uh, so this is Knowledge and Self-Determination. I will leave links in the description box so that you guys can look up more information on uh, J uh, I'm sorry, Thomas L. Jennings and his life even though I didn't find a lot of detailed information, but there are a lot of different resources out there that do have information on him. So, like I said, it's not a determination. Like, learn, and subscribe. And I am out. Peace.